Welcome back to Wings Conference 2016, and today we have a very special guest who's going to be one of our keynote speakers tomorrow, uh, Mr. Philip Marshall. And Philip, I know actually quite a bit about you uh, and your family. You come obviously from a very famous, very well-known American family. Um, but you know what? Uh, there were some things that have happened in your life and in your family's history that you brings you here to Seattle today and, and across the country for a number of things. And I can't explain it any better than you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're here for? Well, what, what has happened is um, years ago, what is now t a decade ago, is I sought guardianship for my grandmother. And the reason I did that, which I now understand that many legal instruments um, can be in the hands of perpetrators, both a weapon and a shield. And in this case, my father had power of attorney for his mother, who he exploited time and again until I filed my petition for guardianship, at which point we saved my grandmother. And stepping back even further, my relationship with sort of the greater social arena of New York, where my grandmother was, lived uh, for decades, for over 50 years, and was a philanthropist nonstop, um, was sort of, I, I had a close relationship with her, but I really wasn't part of New York. And the, the fact that, you know, I was associated with sort of the Astor family wasn't known, and uh, which was fine with me. but. When I saw what was happening to my grandmother, I had to act. And I know, now know that to be complacent about elder justice is to be complicit in elder abuse. So I sought guardianship. In that process, was there anything that uh, you learned or you really hang on to today of, of how you were gonna go about uh, pursuing this? Because this was a difficult, because you're, you're, you're dealing with family issues, uh, not just the legal side of things, too. Right. So what did you take out of this whole thing? Well, what happened is most people have no idea about what they can do for proactive, preventive protection of elders, or including themselves, perhaps, uh, and other loved ones. And I learned about this more back in 2002 when my stepfather died. And he was an Oxford graduate who had total recall on a good year. And he had tried to outsmart himself in terms of planning and financial planning. So in year of closure, my mother and I and my brother really ended up doing damage control, trying to figure out what to do on that end. And I learned so much about finances. And then two years later, kind of came out of that and looked um, down to New York and caught, got an understanding as about what was happening to my grandmother um, by my father. And so my, our family, some people had small family, big problems. It was my grandmother and only son, um, my or our father, and I have a twin brother. Okay. And we're really close and really different. I think that's the nature of twins. And so because it was a small family, really the burden was on me. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of times uh, when you have adult children whose parents influence and maybe cognitive capacity or capacity in general wanes, what, when, what ends up happening is that there's sort of the maladaptive schema of sibling dynamics rears its head. And and then their parents, one or two, hopefully, uh, but their parents end up being sort of collateral damage to family dysfunction. That wasn't really the case with my brother and me at all. But so when I looked and saw what was happening, that my father was doing to his mother, you know, I decided to act. It was a personal decision, but it wasn't tied up in what sometimes ends up being that other layer. Mm -hmm. What are you hoping that the folks out there in the audience are going to take from what you're going to tell them? I am doing two, I'm doing two things right now. I'm sort of a transformation because I end up continuing to recount the 
traumatic experience of my grandmother and quite not to discount what she went through time and again and the secondary victimization of all those a lot of those who helped her so I'm continuing that story but I'm also advancing my work in elder justice uh, I spent four years helping both my grandmother in her last year of life and then the next three years to help respect her testamentary wishes then I spent the last sort of four years um, going from coast to coast doing keynotes and last year I was in front of the US Senate Special Committee on Aging uh, testifying and during the testimony you have five minutes <clears throat> and uh, two-thirds of that was sort of my grandmother's story and a third of it was a, sh a single sheet saying these are some of the recommendations I have to advance elder justice and I, re I realized you know a lot needs to be done so I've taken an unpaid academic leave which allows me to be here yeah. today yeah. and right. and tomorrow yeah. and so I'm I'm both uh, tomorrow I'm sort of recounting my grandmother's story and how it is in a very visceral way informed my commitment to elder justice uh, in various arenas I have no doubt that uh, everyone tomorrow is going to be on the edge of their seat to, to listen to your story and about your advocacy as well. And so welcome to Seattle, Washington. Uh, and we very much appreciate it. Thank you for Thank talking you to us. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Thank you.